today's talk, um, I originally, I wrote this, went through a bunch of uh, different iterations. And then most recently, Adrian Tilston, who's the cyber practice lead over at Resourceive and I, uh, we sat down, he worked through the, the content with me. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jake. He worked through the content with me and we kind of made it uh, the next evolution of this talk. Most of this had been given uh, previously at cybersecurity sales conferences working with people and getting them ready to go out and talk about security, getting them ready to understand how you can, how you can actually protect your clients and how you shift from um, selling traditional like co-location and connectivity into security. So this has been one of my, my most requested talks to give. And um, you know, obviously big, big shout out of, as always to Adrian Tilston. So if you guys haven't had a, had a chance to meet him yet, um, I strongly recommend it. Just a, a solid guy, keeps me honest, and um, you know, he's somebody that you can certainly certainly count on. Uh, and obviously, you know, he he helped out with a lot of this content. So, um, all right, let's let's jump into it. Uh, it's killing me not being on like you know four different screens at once right now. Okay, so we're gonna look at this case study. Um, this is something that Adrian and I get to do quite often, which is um, come into companies, figure out where they're at, how they operate, what their security looks like, and then help coach them on coming from their current state to their future state. Sometimes we'll help them figure out what that future state needs to be. And then we work backwards from there to, okay, like let's let's disable local admin privileges for local users. Let's do all the basic stuff that we need to. So you can do that. You can roll out MFA, but then who's looking at your alerts at 10 o'clock to midnight on December 31st? Okay, how are you doing your IAM and PAM policies? Like how how are you actually doing all of your access management, your account management, your governance? How does that all play in and how does it help you go to market and win? Because that's what businesses do. They go to market and win. Um, and no, Jake, I'm not actually doing the marathon. My wife's doing the marathon tomorrow. I'll probably only run like, I don't know, 10 or 12 miles while I'm supporting. So this is this is not a, a, a huge event for me. And I get to stop whenever I want. Yeah, easy day. That's right. Um, so when Adrian and I come in and you know a few of our other partners, what effectively we see as we look at these different case study companies is kind of the same thing over and over and over again. We see you've got the executive management, maybe there's a board above them. You've got your business development side of the house. You have your finance side of the house. You have your affiliate development side of the house and like how you're growing the point of being able to hand off to the, the business development team. You've got your HR teams, um, usually somewhere in that 50 to 100 people employee uh, size, you get a full director of HR or maybe a chief people officer. You've got your marketing teams, so they're your blog and your social. Um, sometimes they'll have graphics uh, and, and analytics under them as well. And of course, you have your products or your services team. So, you know, that gets broken out into like development and QA. So this is something that we see, you know, quite often. And if you look at the different verticals, this will change. It'll go back and forth. So if you look at so like a security software company, they'll have about 40% or so on the engineering side of the house under product development or delivery support. And about 60% will be out under business development, marketing, finance, et cetera. If we're looking at, um, say, an e-commerce company, they are probably not going to have as much business development. They'll probably be pretty lean and you'll, you'll have a much, much, much larger analytics team and usually your stats will be doing a lot more, excuse me, of uh, your security analysis. So this will shift up a little bit, but this is kind of not only just a general, a general allegory or rhyming for what it looks like. This is a specific company that that we've worked on together. So this is, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna call them case study one, right? But this is a very specific company that we have worked on, that we've been watching, that um, we've been out in the marketplace with. So this is a, this is a case study. And um, what, what this particular company does is they empower local businesses, so basically their affiliates, with software and training and direct sales support 
to take that off their plate so they can go to market and win. So that's that's kind of the the niche of this particular company, and it's the one that we're going to look at through this entire uh, entire landscape. So um, what are they doing? This particular company, they're rapidly growing. They have literally affiliates worldwide. Um, they've got quite a bit in the EU, a little bit in Asia, um, and they're really seen as a market leader in the space that they're in. So specifically, they're the number two in the world. And the, the number one has about 40% uh, of the market share. These guys are about 20% of the market share. And so they're, they're absolutely huge. And they get a ton of publicity um, all over. Mostly, most of their publicity is in the US and Europe. And uh, av estimated revenue, um, We've seen inside their company a little bit, but uh, estimated revenue, if we look at the public sources, is about $180 million, but their operating costs are only $6 million. So like, they've got a huge ROI. They've got um, lots of revenue coming in, uh, low costs, so their profit's pretty large. And so now the question that I have to you all is um, if you were called in, so John, Sam, Jake, if you were called in to this company, to evaluate the security posture, where would you start? Where would you start? I want you to keep that in mind. I, yeah, ask, thank you, Michael. Ask the interns how they log in. Great, great option there, love it. Um, but think think about really where you'd start, how you'd come in, the the questions that you would ask. Um, and I, I can tell you one thing that, that we do whenever we come in, uh, whether we're talking to security or to IT or to finance or your your GRC folks, whatever that blend is, one of the first questions I always ask is, how do you in GRC or security or IT or finance, how do you support the company's overall revenue? Because that, like how the company makes its revenue and how you support revenue, that's how we actually tie to the lifeblood and the mission of the company. So you'd maybe be surprised how many times that um, uh, companies, when we talk to them, like CISOs sometimes don't know how they support the revenue of the company. They're so siloed, they're so broken off. So where would you start on this case study? Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about what we're gonna talk about. So the first piece is know your enemy. So we have to understand if you you know go back to Rocky, Rocky always takes the, the picture of Drago and he puts it on the mirror every morning and he looks at it every morning. And my question out to you all is, are you doing the same thing? Are you looking at the adversary that's out there? So think about that as we go through as well. Uh, we'll take a look at some actual ransom notes that were targeted towards this company. And then we're going to look at the business model of the ransomware teams that are giving those ransom notes. And then of course, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of what you can do when you get the call. And by the call, I mean, when you come into a company or maybe you just got hired on and you're the company's first security hire, or maybe you're doing some consulting in IT and trying to get into security and suddenly like me, security comes to you. That's how I get into security. I was working IT, pulling cables, and I got a call one day that we'd been hit. And this was back in 2001. <clears throat> different story for a different talk. But um, part of the goal here is so that way you can understand the operational environment in which we go to market. And I say we as a security industry, but also understand at that very acute, traumatic point in time, what the hell do you actually do? What do you actually do? And uh, I'm, of course, I'm watching chat, y'all. But if uh, if anything pops up, uh, what I what I'd like you to do with my connectivity is put it in chat because I'm watching and uh, the the Wi-Fi here is absolute crap. So I'm on a couple different hotspots. We're we're good to go. I feel like like I'm in a temperature controlled uh, tent out in the middle of the desert right now uh, with with the austere conditions in Crystal City right now. Okay, so we can't have a security talk without, you know, quoting Clausewitz or Sun Tzu because the fundamentals are the same. The philosophy is the same. So in this aspect right here, um, 
the Mandarin Chinese, and forgive my translation because it's it, it is challenging to to translate it, and you know, there's a million of them, but it effectively says, "If you know your enemy, and you know yourself, you need not fear the outcome of a hundred battles," which is great, and that's a hundred land battles back to back, right? But the issue in our industry is if you look at your firewall logs, go look at them right now and see how many times you're being scanned a minute while I'm talking. So if that's the case, 100 battles, what about 101? What about 102, 103? Where's that entry point? So if you know yourself and you know your enemies, you're invincible. And I can tell you with the hundreds of companies that I've, I've talked with just this year, um, most of them barely know themselves and they sure as heck don't know the enemy. And Sun Tzu says, if you know yourself, but you don't know your enemy, you got a 50, 50 shot of when you're actually in contact. And if you don't, you're dead on arrival. And I've talked with uh, Fortune 100. I've talked with a lot of mid-market, uh, small, medium enterprise, M uh, SMB, biotech, like uh, some of the largest healthcare organizations in the world. And most of them are still struggling with CIS control one and two. And it's, that is a, you know, a big challenge. But as we work through this, if you can get your partners, you can get your team, you can get your clients to do the basic things. Patching when you can patch, and if you can't patch, compensating controls. If you can do those basic things, MFA, like you're going to do well, but if you can get to the point where you understand how your adversaries are working and you can get your teammates that don't have military training to understand why permissions are so important to understand what hackers do and why they do it and how they think you'll continue to win. So um, when we look at Verizon's data breach investigation report for 2022, why, why should we even look at, at this, right? When we look at it, what was the breach? What were actors tr trying to do? What were their motives of when they executed a breach? 88% of breaches, according to Verizon, last year were financially motivated. Now, in this, in this context, or the friends that we've got on this call, um, we have probably targeted uh, you know, defense and espionage and garage and secondary a little bit more, but most of the industry out there, uh, bad guys are doing this for financial reasons. Boom, right there. So financial, 88% of breaches financially. And that doesn't necessarily mean bad guys. It can also mean insider threat because that gets lumped in here as well. So what's your fear? What's your client's fear? Your partner, your stakeholder, your boss. And it's very simple. They're on the highway right out there. They're headed into work and their phone rings. And when you get this call, if you've ever gotten it, it's pretty scary because you answer the phone and you can hear your teammates or your clients, their voices crack. You can basically hear the phone shaking in their hands and they have a hard time talking and telling you what just happened. And usually what they say is just, just can, can you just pull over and look at your messages? Just open your message, we sent you a picture. <laughs> And so then, you know, you, you get in, you get into the slow lane and then you, you get off onto the side and you pull up your phone because you're prudent and you stopped, right? You didn't just keep driving on the highway. You pull up your phone and what do you see? You see a ransom note from Conti. All your files are currently encrypted by the Conti string. As you know, and if you don't just Google it, all the data that has been encrypted by our software cannot be recovered by any means without contacting our team directly. If you try to use additional recovery software, the files might be damaged. So if you're willing to try, try it on the data of the lowest value. To make sure that we can really get your data back, we offer to decrypt three random files completely free of charge. 
You can contact our team directly for further instructions through our website. And you skip through some redacted stuff there. Just in case you try to ignore us, we've downloaded a pack of your internal data and are ready to publish it out on our news website if you don't respond. So it'll be better for both sides if you contact us as soon as possible. So they use both the carrot and the stick. They tell you about their help desk that they have and their customer service support. They offer a proof of value in here of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll decrypt two, two files completely free. They do all the same thing that sales does. Only they've got, instead of, you know, instead of fishing for opportunities, they're coming in hard. So this is an actual Conti ransomware note. Thank you to Sentinel Labs for providing it and publishing it. Um, so we're going to look at Conti. And we're going to look at Conti for a few reasons today. So the first piece is um, <clears throat> when Russia invaded Ukraine earlier this year, um, Conti pledged its support to Russia. So that's interesting. But if we circle back to last September, there was a disgruntled Conti, uh, Conti affiliate. Um, they were pretty upset. They're you know basically a business partner. And Conti, this affiliate, just leaked Conti's entire playbook. Like the whole playbook, all of it. We've got it. And we're going to look at the first page here in a few minutes. Um, we've got it. We've got to unlock. We know exactly what their playbook was back in September 2nd of last year. It's a little over a year ago. And then remember I talked about you, uh, Russia invading Ukraine. Well, when that happened and Conti pledged its support to Russia, they had an entire development cell that was based out of Ukraine. And so, I mean, put yourself in their shoes, right? Here you are, a Ukrainian ransomware cell, and Russia comes in and invades your country, and then the operation that you work for backs Russia. I can tell you that I'd be a little upset. I'd be looking for a grudge. Well, they were too, and this is what they did. So uh, the Ukrainian Conti team published... 170,000 internal chat messages for Conte. 170,000. So all of that intelligence has been sifted through. Heck, out of the 100 people on this call right now, I'll bet some of you have actually done the analysis or, were, were, uh, or participated in the translation. So you can go read all of it and then tie it back to the playbook and then use these stories and heck, it's still Cyber Awareness Month for a couple more days here. You can use these stories to help train your team. Because when you sit down and you say, hey, team, this is what the bad guys are doing. This is how they operate. This is how they work. Your team starts thinking more and more and more like a hacker. And when they think more like a hacker, they start operating differently. They start securing their stuff. They start keeping bad messages out of chat. They start behaving more like many of us were trained to do in the military. But if they can think like it, you'll actually see behavioral change. So now let's look at, uh, at the, the, some of the different threat actors out there. So we have the professional criminal side and the state-sponsored side of the house. So Lockbit 2.0, um, they've been in the news again recently. They own about 38% of the market share here. And um, Conti has about 20% of the market share uh, then we also have Revil and Hive. They've got, you know, they, they battle out at a couple different levels. They, some of them uh, win in their own particular markets, whether it's healthcare, et cetera. Um, but nobody else really owns that, you know, really 60% of the market share like Lockbit and Conti. Now, when we look at state sponsored, we have Lazarus and Black Shadow, commonly associated with North Korea and Iran. And the interesting thing about both of those threat actors is they also tend to eat their young. So they will target people in the same subnet block, in the same ASN, BGP, which means most likely they're actually targeting their own people as a source of funding for themselves. So we're not going to talk about the state-sponsored group. They exist out there. We're going to look at Conti because we got a hell of a lot of data about them. 
Um, so today we're not going to look at at what or how Conti operates, but we are going to definitely look at whom. Who are they? What are they? What are really they doing that are out in the market? So if you want to talk Mimi Cats and Cobalt Strike and PS Exec, we can do that. But again, that doesn't really tell us a lot about who they are. So let's look at their ecosystem. So we have this uh, this ransomware operator in the top right, up up over here. That's that's effectively Conti. But we are going to get to them in a minute because they go to affiliates that um, are in the market. We'll come back to these guys. And then they those guys go to access brokers. So we're looking at effectively what in the US and the UK we call the channel sales model. So these access brokers, um, they are the ones that are out scanning RDP. Um, they're using the exploit du jour. They're going out and buying compromised con credentials or using botnets through a account takeover. So that ATO bot problem. Um, they're the ones that are just getting access to, to a network, to an infrastructure. Um, they're usually pretty junior in the market. Uh, maybe not junior when you think of age, but newer to this, to the section, uh, section of, of the market. And their job is basically just to get creds, get creds or access. Now, then they sell those creds to the ransomware as affiliate group. So think of these as like your business development rec uh, representatives. These are more of like your sales development representatives. Um, these guys, they'll go through once they buy access, they'll start moving laterally around the network. They're the ones that are going to go hunt for uh, SharePoint and then work all the way in, in SharePoint over to legal and then figure out what legals, um, uh, like how much insurance that you have. So they're, they're, they're pretty good at what they do for sure. And then once they've got it, they'll put some of them, depending on who they are and what they do, sometimes they'll actually distribute the payload. Sometimes they don't, but then they sell that access over to the operator. And each of these are a little bit different on how they operate because um, they have different bis literal business relationships. Um, Conti over here, they're the ones that actually build the ransomware or go steal it or buy it. Um, that's why we're, we're going to look at them in this, deeper in a second. They also have their leak sites. So that's their blog post. And then of course they have, you know, payment processing and victim messaging. So this is where remember back when it says contact us and we'll do the free proof of value with the two things. They literally have their own, they have their own basically sales teams. Now, as we, as we go a little bit further down it, let's look at the odds. Let's look at the odds. Um, the odds here is Conti might give their partners 2,500 potential target organizations. And that's just a list. Uh, here's a new industry. Here's the new industry. Take a look. Um, and then from there, of that list, the um, basically those sales development representatives, business development, they'll scan about 60 of them. Of those 60, 20 will get compromised. And then out of those 20, one will see a ransomware event. So the takeaway here is not that you've got a one out of 2,500 op option. The takeaway is 60 out of 60, 20 are compromised. That means easily out of every 60 organizations, or better yet, out of every three organizations, one of them will easily be compromised. One out of three. And then from there, it's just like, hey, we've, we've got these great numbers out of these 20. Let's pick the one that's going to give us the highest chance of payout. So that's those are the numbers. And uh, Jake, if you could give me a thumbs up in chat or something, I just want to make sure that uh, that you all, all can still hear me just fine. <laughs> and y'all, please, please feel free to ask questions uh, as, as we go out. So here's the playbook. Boom. Good to go. Thanks, y'all. Um, yeah, I've got I've got this weird FOMO that like my connection is going to drop and I'm just going to lose you all and keep talking and I'm not going to do right by you. So <laughs> um, here's here's the actual uh, playbook. This is literally the first page of Conti's Conti's playbook. So step 1.1 1 .1 
is they say, use a Google dork to find out a company's revenue. Holy, like that's it. That's OSINT day one, part one, right? <laughs> and then it says, oh, by the way, check more than one website if possible. Use Owler or Manta or ZoomInfo or DNB or Rocket Reach. And you know this is real because they spelled Rocket Reach wrong. They put Rocket Rich. So your sales teams, if you're if you're in you know happen to be working for a cyber organization where your go to market model, you're taking cybersecurity to market, whether it's penetration testing or governance or um, you know building uh, uh, POCs for exploits without having the injection cloud, um, or you're in a, a bug bounty program, your sales teams are using those tools. Your sales teams are using Owler, Manta, ZoomInfo, DNB, and RocketReach. And my question to all your sales teams are, who's better at this, the bad guys or you? Who's better at using these tools? And if I put you head to head against Conti, are you going to be better at Owler or are they? Because they have the carrot and the stick. You only have the carrot. Um, so isn't that kind of interesting? I think it is. Now here's the piece. Remember we had the case study, um, this, this particular company with their, their worldwide affiliates, software and training, this is Conti. So maybe I lied a little bit earlier when I said I worked with them. It was probably more that, uh, we've been watching them and working with our clients who sometimes have to talk to them. So forgive my my breach of honor for the case of storytelling. <laughs> but right here, this is Conti. So when we break it down, this is their org chart right here. Their org chart is broken out. Business development. These are their negotiators that they third party. They've got acquisition teams to go out and actually get more um, uh go get more, say, encryption technologies or um, new ransomware strains, whatever. Um, their finance teams, their finance teams over here, literally, they go through money laundering. So this is where you see things like Ripsaw and um, other Bitcoin cryptocurrency tumblers in order to try to anonymize. They use those, but they also use like a little babushka with her with their headband, uh, uh, a scarf over her head, walking in and withdrawing cash from a Bitcoin ATM, they they have a, like they're a full on criminal network. And then their affiliates, we've already talked about them, but what we haven't talked about yet is their R&D and their HR. So let's jump into it and let's name names. Here we go. This is it right here. So at the very tip top, the CEO of the company, his handle is Stern, one of many. Um, at least it was in the 170,000 uh, uh, messages that, that came out. Stern. And what does Stern do? Well, Stern goes through and he maintains all of the relationships all over the world with all of their partners everywhere. Um, He's involved in quite a lot more than just Conti, but he leads this organization. Over here for HR, Salamandra. Salamandra will go out and he'll hire, find, hire people, sometimes on legitimate job boards, sometimes not, bring them in and give them a pen test and say, hey, here's a target company. See, if, see what you can do. Sometimes he loops them in long enough that they've actually committed a crime and then he can just get his hooks into them. Sometimes he just says, hey, look, you're going to make a ton of money with us. Which, again, this is not a recruiting call for Conti by any means. The blog, what they call their blog, is run by Bio, and he's really their marketing wizard. So anytime that you see um, Conti shutting down or retiring, they just go dark for a little while, and then they pop up with a couple different IOCs and you know, maybe a different ransomware set because – they're basically doing a rebrand every time and bio's in charge of all that rebrand. He's in charge of like the public perception. Um, and also a little bit of the, of the actual, Hey, here, we decrypted some of your stuff and here it is. So once, 
HR scoops up uh, sale manager, hires somebody. He hands them over to Twin for training. And Twin puts them through a training pipeline because like any good organization, you need to have onboarding, right? <laughs> uh, Colin, they call it blockchain, but that's really their encryption. So he does that. That's, that's pretty narrow focus. And then you have A team, B team, and C team. Rosetka, Red and Alley, Steven and Mango. And if you look at any of the content here, uh, Red and Alley, Steven Mango for B teams and C teams. Um, they're fairly decent partners and they co-lead the, the, their different orgs. Uh, Rosetka, kind of a jerk, wouldn't be a good boss. But then again, when you're working for the mob, you don't really have a choice of boss and it's kind of hard to get out. So um, if you're on A team, sucks to be you. So they break it out into different cells. Developers, pen testers, OSINT, admins, QA, and reverse engineers. That's right. They actually QA their, their, their code. They put a lot of work into their QA. Because if you're going to go through and you're going to hit a company, and then the company gives you a couple million dollars, and you haven't QA'd your code properly, and you can't actually deliver the unlock like you said you could, now you've suddenly got a huge marketing problem back to bio, and no one's going to pay out. So you basically told the world at that point, if you don't do good QA, you're not an honorable thief. So that's one of the things that bio often goes up and he basically projects out into the world. He says, we're honorable thieves. So who gets hit? Who's a target? Um, most companies think when we're, we're going out and talking to companies, most companies think that um, if you have a really large bottom line, you're a target. Not the case, not the case at all. And in fact, it's if you have a top line. So if you have any revenue coming in, they don't care if your margins are 1%. They care if you have revenue and if you have insurance and if they think you can pay, that's it. So if you have money and you do business, you're a target. Remember 88% financially motivated. So by segment, let's look at by segment. Um, we have higher education on the, the kind of that brown up here on the top left. I want to call them out specifically because that's usually usually sometime around finals week that higher ed gets hit. In fact, we've seen actual universities that have been around for 100 years get ransomed during finals week and they have to shut their doors. It's sad. It sucks. Um, other, because... It's hard to classify stuff in the market. Healthcare, 17%. Um, this one's going up. This one's going up quite a lot. And if you watch the healthcare space, um, part of it is because they're very confident in their compliance programs. And they still believe often that compliance and security go hand in hand. And I can feel some of you laughing right now through the screen because I agree. Um, but when you look at like the DBIR, you see some of the highest percentage of hacks in healthcare, of actual breaches the highest cost breaches, um, the highest amount of, um, uh, of, of broad-based lawsuits. Um, and then you also see the highest reported pers internal perspective of their own security. So to me, that sounds like an ego problem. You think you're good, but you also have the highest amount of hits. The, the numbers would suggest differently. Media and entertainment, I mean, that goes back to Sony getting hit uh, by North Korea. Energy, this one's growing quite a lot. In fact, uh, I probably am having like two to three calls with energy companies a week right now. Um, unique unique spaces. Um, yes, uh, Sam, I see you uh, asking about HIPAA still considers vaccine be secure. Oh, God, yeah. Um, so the, the good thing about HIPAA is that it gets people to think about it. But when you get HIPAA certified, it doesn't actually remove the needle. High trust starts to move the needle a little bit. Um, and then the two pieces that we're really seeing move the needle on security right now is fire and the American um, the HA, American Heart Association, just redefined the ethical standards for telehealth. So that's been really interesting to watch and see the move on that. Um, and then a, a bunch of telehealth effectively providers in that space are growing rapidly. So something to watch, and this is not financial advice, by the way, or 
um, relating to securities at all. Um, so let's let's look at the pyramid of pain. This is not the normal pyramid of pain. This is one that I've adapted specifically for ransomware. And it's basically what we see in the, the news is give us dollars and we're going to lock your computers. But we all know at this point, the bad guys are doing multiple types of hits. So multiple leverage points. So it's, yeah, we've got your data and we'll leak your data. Um, we'll lock your computers. That's the visible part because this creates a lot of pain across the entire organization. And then, oh yeah, by the way, since we've got access to everybody's computer, we're going to look at, you know, maybe some uh, executives, webcams, then blackmail them outside. And then of course, we'll just kick you while you're down because DDoS is cheap and we'll just fire a couple DDoSs at you. So we're starting to see these multiple leverage points and um, each ransomware operator, e each partner in that ecosystem do it a little bit differently. In fact, there's a, I'm forgetting their name off the top of my head, but there's a new group right now that's going out and um, they're going to pivot soon, I'm sure. But they will ransom a company and they will make that company go out and like video themselves talking about the ransomware group saying how good they, they they'll literally be like, you have to say that we're good. You have to film yourself giving a thousand dollars to five different homeless people. And then you have to post it to social media. And if you don't get enough engagement, it doesn't count on social media. So they're going out and they're really working to basically greenwash themselves or, and by green, I mean, um, the color of Robin Hood's apparel, really, really get everybody to think that they're, uh, you know, honorable thieves, but um, I'm sure they're going to pivot here shortly. So every one of these is a little bit different and they go at different places. So we talked, we talked a little bit, you know, pretty heavily about Conti. Let's talk about how, and this is where we get to go quickly. Initial access, same things you think. RDP, vulnerable interface, uh, internet facing systems, like every month on Tuesday, Microsoft Exchange server zero days. Is it three, four, five, six, zero days this week? I don't know. Old VPN companies, et cetera, et cetera. Weak application settings, you know? Because if you don't secure your stuff and I can log in, you've effectively now made the entire world an insider, which means the entire world is an insider threat. Y'all know phishing, y'all know phone calls or vishing. Um, the interesting things here, I think, are the SEO to, to fake software. So it's actually seeing marketing links on like uh, Google or Facebook that are sending out to malicious sites, uh, not because they exist, but because of the SEO. And of course, all of this, a lot of this is just internet facing. So we're seeing a lot of insurance companies going out and scanning. So the actual insurance underwriters doing attack service discovery and saying, hey, you've got 15 open RDPs. Insurance denied. Um, and I th think, keep me honest here, y'all. I think uh, my time is up. So I'm going to slam out through these last little bits. We can blame Tom for going long in the first piece, but I certainly don't want to uh, uh, to make Mike wait any longer than uh, he needs to. So next piece, obviously, Mimi Cats, uh, Cobalt Strike, et cetera. This changes all the time. And then Persistence. And of course, the big piece is you can automate all that and go straight to Persistence, right? That's that's what we do. We're, we're hackers in this world. So if we look at it, um, the last couple of things I'll put in here, Dark Trace, great partner. They do a lot of really good work. Um, this is the uh, entire healthcare system in Ireland was shut down by Conti, and this is the entire timeline for it. When we look at um, their takeaways through the, uh, the healthcare system uh, enterprise, it actually took a while. It took from March 18th to actual detonation um, in May. And why did it take so long? Because one, the initial people got access and then organizationally they sold that access to somebody else who then started moving around the network. And then finally Conti came in and said, boom, we're done. And they basically shut down and they, they sent the HSE back to paper charting for quite a while. So, Obviously, get your partners to think about zero trust because we don't want to get hit. You don't want to get that picture in the morning. Um, 
you can go through like this is actual negotiations with a ransomware actor. Um, then I promise we talk about what you can do. So Mike, give me give me another ninety seconds here, and I'll I'll be done. Um, when that happens, I don't tell clients to do things. I'll be very clear. When I get a call for incident response, I don't tell my clients to do things because that means I am assuming all of that risk. Um, I have partners that do incident response. I will let them tell it, tell them to do something. The questions that I will ask are, have you talked to legal yet? Um, sometimes I'll ask, do you know how extensive this is? Um, a little bit further on in the conversation, I'll say, have you talked with marketing? And usually they'll say no. And I'll say, okay, you, well, here's what I would do. I would want to, once we figure out the impact of this in the next 18 to 24 hours, I would probably want to talk to marketing um, because we may need to get ahead of the story. And I'll say, have you pulled up your incident response and your disaster recovery plans? And if they ask why, I say, because you have to follow your plans because sometimes in the market we see insurance companies not paying out if you fail to follow your damn plan. And then are you prepared to review your logs? Because your forensics team is going to want to look at them. Um, ransomware is only about 15% of the total cost. Most of the actual cost comes down to companies not being able to take in new revenue, not be able to book new revenue, a la Colonial Pipeline. And then this is that something that's actually happening right now. Um, this is uh, from May, so a little bit ago. But Russia, uh, sorry, Conti, Conti literally shut down Costa Rican government and said, we're going to coup you. We're going to initiate a coup unless you pay us. So super interesting. So who gets hit? Do you have money? Then you're a target. Um, and remember that uh, you're basically dead if, uh, if, if you don't know yourself and you don't know your enemy. Uh, that's it, guys. Uh, I hope this was good for you. Uh, three and a half minutes over. I apologize to Mike again. But um, I hope you learned something. Go out there. Secure your friends, secure your partners. Have a good day and reach out if you have any other questions. Talk to you later.